government. Good afternoon, everyone. I now call the workshop to order at 2.45 p.m. This record should reflect that all seven board members are still in attendance, along with Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard, and Board Clerk Tony Bellotta. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, well, our first workshop today is on health-related policies. We've grouped five policies together uh, that kind of are all connected, and uh, Mr. Keith I'm sorry, Mr. Keith Oswald, Chief of Equity and Wellness, is going to start us off. Thank you, Mr. Burke, and good afternoon, board members. With me today um, are our health specialist, Dr. Mara Smith, that you've seen before, and also the newest member to our team, Ms. Carla Berlingeri. So she's also on our team as well, so we're glad to have her, as well as legal counsel with Laura Pincus. So as Mr. Burke stated, we do have five policies that we want to walk through, some changes mainly due to changes in legislation this past year, in particular the Parent Bill of Rights. So I'm gonna turn over to Dr. Smith who will walk through these changes and then at the end take any questions you may have. Good afternoon board members. Um, in reference to each of these policies, uh, the proposed revisions will update each of these policies to uh, reflect or allow it to be in accordance with the most recent, recent legislation, which would be the Parent Bill of Rights as well as House Bill uh, 173, which is the care of students with seizure or epilepsy uh, disorder. Policy 5.321, um, administration of student medication and treatment. We have uh, made proposed revisions to this one to again um, reflect that we need to obtain parental consent uh, before we um, engage in any type of um, school health services for the um, student as in giving them medication or conducting um, treatments. This policy also, um, or should I say House Bill 173 also impacts this policy because House Bill 173 reflects us providing uh, medication to students with uh, seizure or epilepsy disorder. Policy 5.3212, blood glucose monitoring is yet another uh, policy that is impacted by the Parent Bill of Rights. We've also included language in this policy to reflect that um, any type of monitoring, blood glucose monitoring should be in alignment with a physician's authorization or the student's individualized health care plan or an emergency uh, care plan. Policy 5.325, once again, Parent Bill of Rights impacts this policy where we want to make sure that parental consent is um, obtained before we do any type of examination of any student that may or may not have uh, head lice. Policy 5.324, students with life-threatening health conditions. Uh, this policy is impacted by House Bill 173 in regards to caring for students with epilepsy or seizure disorder. A part of the um, bill requires that we now have what we call an individualized seizure action plan. It is a plan that must be developed by the physician in conjunction with the parent. Once the parent brings this individualized seizure action plan along with the physician's authorization, we are able to proceed in providing uh, care. We have made, um, we have created a way or an avenue to care for students whose parent does not present with an individualized seizure action plan because we're learning that a lot of pediatricians aren't aware of this as of yet. So we do have measures in place that we would still be able to provide emergency care until we receive an individualized seizure action plan. A part of House Bill 173 also now requires that any school district staff who is gonna have regular contact with the student that has epilepsy or seizure disorder, that those employees are trained yearly in how to recognize signs and symptoms of students with epilepsy and how to care for them. And what we have done is created an online course 
that is um, authorized by the Epilepsy Foundation. Our ESC contacts at all of our schools will identify who is an employee or staff member that has regular contact with the student and ask them to self-enroll in the course that we're offering through the Professional Development Department. Principals in turn will be monitoring this to make sure that um, their staff are in compliance. Policy 5.32, student illness or accident. This is again impacted by the Parent Bill of Rights. We now have to make sure that we have consent before we um, engage in any type of provision of school health services. We also have to make sure parents are aware that because of this um, legislation, if they do not consent to us providing care, then we will need to call them and have them pick up their child in instances where there might be bumps, scrapes, cuts, et cetera. However, we do make sure parents are aware that if there's an emergency, we will provide emergency care until um, emergency services arrive on the campus. So that concludes the presentation. We'll be back for development in November, November 30th and for adoption in January. And we'll open up in case there are any questions. Mrs. Whitfield. So two questions. Um, the first thing, I, I desperately want it to be known that if something happens to my kid, please, please, please help her. Um, that scares me more than anything. So uh, my concern is if I'm a parent of any of these children out there um, and say the parent misses checking that box, do we follow up to make sure that they chose yes or no? Because I just, I can't imagine what if a parent just skips it because we have a lot of parents that maybe miss something or whatever, they don't, they don't get it and so we have no answer, then what do we do? So we've been working on a number of campaigns to get these returned to school. Mm -hmm. We're at roughly about 80% return rate um, as a district, so it's gone up a lot um, from the beginning of the school year. We're continuing to provide updates to schools, um, how many returns, how many yeses and no. Of that 80%, I will say that about 4% um, are no's for consent to health services, Four. about 4% 4 okay. of the 80. Um, and then that other 20% is where we're working to close that gap okay. to get those returned. Okay, the other question I have is about um, where that line is, because you're saying that if they say no, and then the kid mm -hmm. is having an emergency, and like we have an AED there, maybe we have a trained CPR person there, at what point are we just standing there not doing it? Or are we actually gonna step in? I'm just, I, I can imagine the moment right now and it scares the life out of me that we were standing there and a child dies because the parents said no and we didn't touch them. Um, so I'm like, when does it constitute an emergency enough that we override that um, and, and do something or when is it not? Can you like talk about that a little bit? If we deem that the injury or incident is serious, then yes, we will. For example, we will uh, perform first, we will provide first aid, we will, we will perform CPR, we will use an AED, just like we would now. If there is an emergency now, we notify the parent, we call 911, and of course we have a crisis response team that returns, that responds to emergencies, and we have the school nurse uh, that responds uh, to emergencies. We have um, uh, PBSD 2667, which is another form it's called parent slash guardian consent for school health services. We utilize this for parents that need to make modifications if they've chosen no um, on the uh, consent form. And to um, piggyback on what Mr. Oswald said, anytime I am aware of parents choosing no, I have called, I have spoken with parents. I have okay. made sure parents understand exactly what they are saying no to. Mm -hmm. And if in talking with them, they understand, they're like, okay, no problem. I can go and utilize 2667 and change um, my consent. But yes, we would never sit back and not perform any type of first aid, CPR or AED. We're gonna do just like we've done in the past. That's why we put this uh, proposed revision into this policy and that's why we created PBSD 2667 so that we explain all of that out in detail to parents and I do uh, do follow-up calls with parents, and I have had parents call me. And once I under make them understand what's going on, they've changed their consent. Okay. And that message has also been communicated to school principals and their teams to call 911 um, in any case of emergency or concern. And that has already occurred this year. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Oswald. I think you just touched on it because as we work through these policies uh, in the uh, beginning stages, and uh, this is the law now, as we work with the Parental Bill of Rights, are we actually making sure that the PTAs and the PTOs and the SACs, these are kinds of things that we're discussing, uh, the new Parental uh, Bill of Rights, how we're gonna be working through all of these policies. We're not there yet, but this is what we have in place. Is this something that's a, a communication strand that's strong at school centers so that parents who are involved at the school way before somebody gets sick or hurt or whatever, that they know that we have these components in place. Can you tell me how that works? Yeah, so it started uh, obviously early on with a number of push outs from you know, our conference, our call here that we did with the community. Each school has given out numerous um, call outs for their community. We pushed it out um, electronically, centrally. Um, we've been gone to a number of different community groups to assist us um, that work with certain communities to educate. I mean, myself personally, I've been working through all the different agencies on DDC, Berta 22, um, many others to assist with this outreach, um, to educate people about this new process and new practice. Um, and that continues to we, you know, close that gap of the additional 20% so we can get those in. So uh, working with our um, FTE SIS team, they're creating you know, reports so that principals can have the latest updates of the actual family so they can be more strategic and target the outreach based on those numbers. Ms. Brew. Thank you, and just to piggyback on what Ms. Andrews said, I think that as we go forward, an incident that happened this week actually is causing me to, to think this through, and I'll tell you what that was, but it's our young children who are coming into pre-K and kindergarten. We need to make sure the parents understand this too because they're gonna be new to the district. I know this is new for everyone, and the reason that I'm saying that is I had a hospital call me yesterday about it was a charter school student and the child is insulin dependent, and the school didn't know it, and he was, having, he was in crisis at the hospital, and also was getting speech therapy and didn't know that he was entitled to ESC services. So um, Kevin McCormick's helping, so I saw, saw Laura's expression. We, I reached out to him. We are helping the charter school. Um, by Monday, it will be, everything should be in place in terms of the student when he's back in for the insulin, but it makes me realize that these young parents, the families coming into the schools, really don't know, you know, whether he was in a charter school with us, what the child, you know, what they need to provide. I mean, the mom had no clue that she needed to tell this to the school. So um, I think that we need to have a, that is part of the package when a child enrolls, whether they're young and just were new to the district or whatever, I think that communication piece is going to help us tremendously. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And just to follow back up on the communications piece, just last night we were at Wellington, L Wellington uh, Village Education Committees. Those committees, i.e. in Royal Palm, you all know who they are, uh, uh, Westlake, uh, mm -hmm. the Tri-Cities. I think these new laws that are in place for parental rights and talking about these issues, these that we're talking about today and all the other ones that are in place, we need to be out there uh, spreading that word just as you say you're doing, Mr. Oswald, at those committees too because what I'm hearing is that people says, well, we're not communicating and they don't know exactly whether we're doing what we say we're doing. Well, we certainly follow the law and this is what we're talking about now through the policies. So I think just having it at the school center but outside of the school center at those <laughs> advisory councils that we have throughout the district where they work with the elected officials and the cities so that they'll know that we're talking about this, we're doing something about it, and we're certainly following the law. Thank you for that feedback. We'll work on that as well. Question. Um, from a liability point of view, you said you only had four no's, but, and you call those parents and explain? 4,000. 4,000 no's? 4%. 4% is 4,000 and change. Oh, I, I thought you said no. four. No. So we, we do, we, <laughs> no. Unfortunately, I shouldn't be laughing because it's not a joke, right? So what we're working is to educate those parents that mark no. So we created a protocol, a script for our principals for those who did mark no to go through their list to really explain, do you understand um, what this means? And so they have a script that we gave them to use by marking no, so that if they do want to, as Dr. Smith stated, update that to update those forms. Um, 
in our SIS system. So, so we're dependent on each principal to do what they're supposed to do and make sure that they talked to the parent that said no. We have it, do we have any documentation on that? Did the principals have any kind of form they fill out and said I called the parent, the parent to discuss the no, the parent still says no? We need documentation because I can just see a lawsuit coming where the parent says, I never got that call. The principal says, well, I did make the call. We need some kind of documentation, general counsel. Would you agree we need some kind of documentation if we're taking it on ourselves to call these parents to confirm that they're no, we need documentation th that that call was made? Well, documentation is always a good thing, uh, but there's many ways to document. I mean, you can, you can, you can keep a, a log um, of it. So um, I'm sure there's something that we can put our heads together on and, and figure out what that would look like. But you know, there's many ways to note something without it, you know, creating another form and that sort of thing. Well, so. I'm not so sure that leaving it up to 180 principles and each having their own way to document something is a good idea. I mean, I think if you're going to make these no calls, you should have some kind of log that they keep that, that documents. I talked to so and so on such and such a date and explained and, and we have documentation that was done because 180 principals may do it 180 different ways and have to go back and look at their post-it notes that I put a post-it note on my desk and I can't find it now, but I did talk to that parent on, I don't remember the date, but I called. That's not sufficient for litigation. We need something more formal than that. Superintendent? I'd just like to, I guess, remind us that this is, this is a result of le legislation for the Parents' Bill of Rights. So. The legislature, in their infinite wisdom, has given the parents the rights, and with that comes responsibility. We're doing everything we can to make sure they're making informed decisions, but if we want to talk about liability, let's talk about the legislature. They passed the law. We know under the Good Samaritan law that we can you know, call 911, we can help in an emergency, uh, but I don't really want to create another burden on our schools beyond doing everything we reasonably can do. Uh, but not to be held to some additional standard that's not in the law that was created not by our doing, but by that of the legislature. So well, with all due respect, then we shouldn't call any parent. If you call some of them and they you know, explain what a no means, but you don't call the other ones when something happens, the person that didn't get the call saying, well, my friend got a call, I didn't understand that I was checking a no box. So if you're going to call some, you need to call all. If you're going to call, if you're not going to call, if you're going to call them, then you need to document it one way or the other. I mean, if we're going to take it upon ourselves to call parents and explain no, then we need to document that we did it so that no parent can say half the other people in my neighborhood got calls and I never received a call. I didn't understand that no meant you weren't going to do such and such. So I understand the legislature put this on us just like every other burden that they put on us, but we need to make sure we have litigation protection in the future. You can't call some parents and not other ones, and you have to have a log to indicate which parent you called, right? I mean, it just makes sense, General Counsel. It makes sense to have some kind of documentation if we're going to call any parent, we need to make sure that we call all the parents, and we need to make sure that we document that we called all the parents. Documentation always makes sense. So you'll, you'll never get me to say that documentation is not a, a, the, good, the right or the good answer. Um, I will say that we already have in writing, I mean, we've, 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 we've met our legal requirement by uh, getting the, the noticed or the lack thereof by the, pa the parent has already indicated their preference. So we've met the legal requirement there. Um, but, you know, documentation is always a good well, I mean, a, we've met the legal requirement, so don't call them. Don't, they filled out a form and they said no. Don't call any of them then. Either call them all or don't call any. That's be gone beyond what the state requires us to do. Don't start with them. We're going to call these, but this principal didn't get around to calling those because we are going to get sued. So just don't call any. They, the, the statute says they check a box, they check no. Okay, you check no. Don't come back to us later and say, well, you didn't understand. You checked no, you had the opportunity to ask questions, you didn't. So I don't think we should pick and choose which ones we're gonna call or take a chance that some of them don't get called. I think Dr. Robinson, you were first and then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Um, so first, I mean, I wanna thank you for going above and beyond. That's what medical people do, right? So if it turns out that legal counsel says don't call them whatever okay but i think part of this problem could be solved with technology okay because so the the new and returning student registration form is online now right and 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 it's my understanding that at some point in the foreseeable future nobody will need to print it the 
data processor won't have to enter it. Like it'll just go into poof wherever it goes in technology space, right? Okay, so I mean, I would like to consider adding to that that the consent for school health services must be completed in order for the registration to be complete. Um, does that make sense? I mean, I don't know if legal will say that's good or bad, but in my mind, you're not registered until you complete that form and complete it in total. So that if you're not answering yes or no, it's not completed. We do train the data processors to go through. But I'm saying sure when done. we get to the technology land, which I hope is soon, yes. okay. Okay. so the data processors don't have that additional burden. Right. I also, I don't think this should be a burden placed on any school-based staff, honestly. I think, I, I don't think principals should be having a call. I mean, I just think that's ridiculous. What I would ask for um, the people who make computers work for us <laughs> um, is that maybe if they check no, that there's like an alert that pops up and says like attention realize that if you check no this i know it says that but do an alert like that you know flash right does that make sense mm -hmm. because then that's kind of like a double thing and that and that flat that pop-up could also mm -hmm. say if you have additional questions call you know dr smith or whoever the right person is right but i think i think technology needs to solve that for us right um now i just have a couple more things so um, so first off, I think that lice are nasty and not being able to screen if you think the kid has lice is nasty. But I see that if that they could keep them home until they get clearance or they could just come to school and everybody know they have lice, but we can't look. Is that, tell me what's going on with lice, please. Well, in the event where you have this particular student who has the lice, if they see the nurse, the nurse sends them home and then you have other students that are in the class that depending on the situation, we may need to examine those who may have been exposed to the student who did have the lice. And so if a student, if a parent has not given us consent, quite naturally, and of course being medical, you can almost look without necessarily touching a student to see that they have uh, lice. This is where you would do this in regards to the one who you think have lice. But as far as the students who needs to be examined, if the parent does not give consent for it, then we don't give consent for it. And for the one that we do send home, who we saw had lice, if they don't have parental consent, then the parent shouldn't bring the student back unless they have a note from the doctor saying okay. that they are cleared. Because our protocol now is, if we send you home due to lice, before we put you back into the population, the nurse checks you to make sure you no longer have lice. Okay, so the way, maybe I didn't read this um, as closely as I should have, but um, my concern is I didn't see that the policy said we can send you home for suspected lice. So I just need to like close that loop. Not right? suspected, but diagnosed okay. with lice. Because generally, if a student is thought to have lice, we send them to the school nurse. The school right, nurse. but they don't have consent. This they is don't have consent, then we have to send them to the front office. We have to let the uh, parent know that we suspect that the child have lice, and they need to get the child um, examined, and they can bring them back as long as we have documentation saying that they're not, they don't have lice. Okay, let me just be crystal clear, because I think I heard you. I just want to make sure I did. So, you don't have consent to examine for lice, no. right? The kid's scratching, whatever, whatever. You think the kid has lice, right? You call mom, you said, say, okay, I think your baby may have lice. Baby needs to stay home until you bring a note from the doctor. Is that what you're telling me? Well, we recommend, <laughs> that's what we say. We recommend, okay. All right. <laughs> we, don't, we don't use the word must. Okay, okay. We I, say I got it. recommend. And of course, if the parent doesn't, we can't keep the child out. We, okay. we come back, we do it again, we keep the process going over and over and over. Okay, so I want to move on um, to the this individualized seizure action plan. Yes. Is there a template for that that's given to the pediatricians to complete? Yes. Um, okay. I myself, I've worked with um, the Department of Health to create a universal Right. Individualized seizure action plan. Okay. And just as we do with all of our other physicians' authorizations, we're going to be visiting local pediatricians, giving them this form, and then we're making it where they can access it from us at any given time. So that way we have one universal form versus 
all these different variations of form. Very good. Because, I mean, that was my concern because, you know, when it's crisis time, it's like you don't have time to look up and, say, you know, it's just, and in the real world, you know, if it's a cardiac arrest or seizure, like you know what you're going to do, like even if you never heard of this person before, there's protocols, right? So I just want to make sure that we're not asking our people to like figure out every little nuance for each kid in the emergency. Okay. And then um, I just kind of want to follow up on the question I think Ms. Whitfield asked about um, the difference between an urgent situation mm -hmm in an emergent situation, right? So it's clear that sometimes you're gonna call 911. I think maybe the question is in that middle ground where they need to be seen, but it's not 911. Um, and you call the parent and they're like, I'll get them when I get off work. No, we're, we're erring on the side of caution. And I can only say this the way I know to say it. As a medical person, you just, you just, you, you know. You take you can, care of the patient. And okay. the whole idea is the patient is first. Mm -hmm. Saving life is primary. Thank you, Dr. Smith. You're welcome. Mrs. McQuinn and Mrs. Whitfield. I agree with Dr. Robinson about individual schools, not just the work involved, but I think with 180 schools around, we, we simply, I, don't, I think we invite liability when we expect uniform uh, compliance across that many schools when something happens in terms of the calls. And I'm not sure why we can't do some kind of flag or alert. We do it with medical conditions, right? And Okay, so I, I'm not sure that we can't do, that something can't pop up with that student that says they have a no. We, in S, in the student information system, we do have some of those flags. I'm trying to remember if it's in the affirmative or the negative. Yes, in, in SIS, we do have a flag, but I think what she's, what Dr. Robinson is speaking more so of being able to input the data into the system and the system sends an alert and then can basically give you a list of all of these students that may or may not have consent and you can work from that. We sort of kind of have something like that. We've been working with FTE and student reporting and they've created like this step-by-step um, -step process of how each school can go in and actually pull up the number of um, students who they do not have consent for, or should I say, who, do, who they do not have consent for and whose parents have said no. And then they work, the principals and the school work from that list to try to reach out to the parents just to make sure. And just you know, to let you know this, um, Chairman and the rest of you, the, the reason I think we're going, not I think I know, the reason I know we're going um, as far as we're going is because a lot of these parents just really don't understand the gist of that law. And so what the schools are doing is they're trying their best to help them to understand it. And then I let them know if you, if you can't explain it or if you have a problem, have the parent call me. And then I explain it to the parent. And sometimes just giving them the understanding, they change it. And so that's why we're really going out the way we're going out because we really believe that they don't understand what they're saying no mm -hmm. to. So follow up, please. So again, I think that we communicate that at the district level because across all those schools, I, I just think they will interpret things different ways. And you know, you're on the phone or whatever with a parent and you're, now you're in a dialogue. So I, I'd rather say something that says, if you want further explanation, call the school versus making it incumbent upon the school in the first place to follow up. Can I just uh, offer that when we had our back to school press conference, Mr. Oswald highlighted this change. Uh, it's been part of our whole, our principal meetings, uh, the forms. I mean, we've been pushing this information out quite a bit. Uh, I think there has been a lot of follow up on those parents to check no to make sure they understood that they were not saying no to a, a vaccination 
you know, that was some of the confusion around the COVID vaccinations. That's not what this is about. This is about some basic health care services, uh, and we can continue to work on that. I just get concerned about creating another layer of responsibility because, you know, where does it stop? You can try to call a parent five times. You may not get through. Um, you know, you can send emails. You can do all these things. But uh, I'm just hesitant to say every principal must make sure they connect with every parent that's checked no because I think we might have a hard time following through on all that. But we're doing the best we can. Ms. Whitfield and Mrs. Andrews. Okay, I just want to respond to what Mr. Burke was saying um, about the legislature. I, they come up with rules that they that we have to enforce, and then if there's fallout from that, which we've recently seen in in lawsuits that we've gotten, we still get sued. So they're not getting sued for the outcome of of a bad decision. So we are always going to be on the hook for that. And I don't want in the middle of the political fighting that occurs that any children get hurt um, because that's our job, right? That's like the number one, like every place that I go and talk to people, I say first is safety and then we'll educate your kids. Um, so I don't like the idea that we have a parent out there. I mean, if a parent says no and they really don't want it, I get it, okay, that's fine you have the right, you can do that. And I fully support them having that right. But if a parent thinks that they're saying no, and like you said, for the vaccine, I get that, that turned into a big thing. They don't want anybody to vaccinate on their campus. I get that. But I'm imagining, say you have a kid who you know is bleeding profusely. Are we not supposed to offer a paper towel or a bandage or a compress or something, try to stop the bleeding? Is that is that where we're at? Are we at a point where this child is gonna be sitting there a bloody mess waiting for the mom to show up? And does mom understand that? Is that really what she wants? Um, and that, that scares me. That That is a real day-to-day -day situation. The other thing I wanna say is our principals out there, our teachers out there, nobody signs up for this job because you don't like kids. Like, how are they gonna sit there and look at a child that's in distress and not touch them unless they're 100% sure that that's what mom really wants. Like, and I, I just can see some of these moms and dads not filling out the form correctly because they just didn't get it. And that, that scares me a lot. So uh, how do we resolve this issue? I agree, we don't want the principals or the teachers to have to do anything else. But I mean, now who's responsible for the, making the call? I've heard that your office is going to do it if, if the principal can't do it. Is the principal supposed to do it first? Is, I mean, who's supposed to make the call on the nose? So I want to be clear. When, as far as the calls, everybody that's marked no, we pushed out additional communication to what Mr. Burke was alluding to um, through our communications team so we can target certain groups of parents, but it's still a matter of whether or not those come back. Um, they're not. We still had, we're still at a 20% gap. So there's been additional outreach of everybody. It's just that they're still not coming back. So unless we're doing a home visit for 20,000 at 20%, you know that's pretty much where it's at. So principals are have done a, a, a lot of additional outreach, especially at the beginning of the school year. I think that's how we got to this 80%. And our district district is not immune to this issue. Other districts are kind of seeing a similar issue of how do we get to that last group that are unaware they didn't do it. Um, and my other concern, there's been different legal con concerns around that this may have to be done at each school year. So one of the um, issues I'll be putting on our, you know, from district staff legislative platform is that this rolls forward that whatever a parent marks, so we don't have to start over again next school year that this carries forward. So, so just answer my question. So are we have done being, it. We've are done the principals the being told that they're supposed to call the no's? Is that one of the things you're telling principals? You, you need to call these people that said no and see if you can get in touch with them. Is that so what the our principals have already been? have worked through that? You know, we've gone through the first semester. They have a list that they, if if they see a parent that they knows a no on there and they happen to be at the school, they'll try to get that. Or maybe the classroom teacher. So they've done already a, a, a lot of outreach on this. But they're not required. At, at different levels. No, but they have their list so that they, they, I get if they want I get, to target. I get they have a list. My only question is, we can't do this haphazardly. Are the principals told they should try and follow up or not? If, if they're not told, I mean, are you telling every single principal in every school, you need to follow up on the nose or you're not going to follow up on the nose? I mean, I just see litigation here. You know, we've had other issues where the board didn't see the litigation coming and we got smacked. 
I can see litigation here. So if there's going to be a rule on written board policy that you need to call the no's, then is that what you're telling the principals or not? We did. We haven't asked that recently. We've given them updated list of as we get more in, we give them the updated list of the yeses, the noes, and the not returned so that they have the most updated list for their school. All right, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Andrews and Mrs. McQuinn. And, and I just want to thank the teachers because it truly all starts in the classroom where the children are. The parents uh, love their teachers more than likely. They know their teachers the best. And when something happens to a child, it happens sort of in the classroom. And I know at the principal level, they're putting this stuff out to make sure parents understand. That's why my first question was, are we continually talking about it at our PTAs, our SACs, and so on, and let them know that, yes, you had, the law is here. We've given the information to you. Parents have made their choices based on the law. We are following the law. But I just want to thank the teachers and the principals because they have been tr supporting these parents making the decision, yes or no. And we have to continually work with them and educate them on whether you want to stay with your yes or you want to do a no, but this is what it is. But whenever something happens, we have to follow the law. So I mean, following the law is the critical piece of this, but educating everybody and thanking the teachers and the principals, especially at the school level. We're sitting here doing the policy, but it all starts in the school center, right in the classroom. Mrs. McQuinn and Dr. Robinson. So I think I'm hearing Dr. Oswald say that schools have been directed to contact the no's. And I believe that there needs to be a point at which we don't put that responsibility on them. I do believe we have the technology to somehow flag. I don't know what could even come up. But another, I think it was um, under a couple of, of departments when we were in the COVID, our district did a great job of doing Q and A's in very layman's language. Here's a question, here's an answer. And I think we can do that. Um, schools can even follow up if it's done at the district level, send that in their newsletters or whatever they do. But I don't think that we're going to not get somebody. And that one person that we don't get is going to sue us. So I think we need to put the responsibility on the district level. We're not going to have compliance across all these schools. I want to be clear that at the beginning of the year, we did, this is all I worked on for weeks. So call outs, push outs for communications is here. Um, principals did follow up. So when we say a lot of outreach to get to 80%, first couple of weeks we were at like 40 percent we quickly got it up to 80 percent so we were looking at the numbers so I want to make it clear that we're in November now that a lot of that was done months ago it kept me up at night I got phone calls from principals over and over so clearly working to push out to community groups so um, I want to be clear the district took above and beyond efforts to make sure that this was put out and we continue to do periodic uh, push outs. We had local media coverage going out to schools, educating families about this. So yeah, so this is what you know, we're workshops in the policy today. Uh, let me kind of I'll circle back with our team here and just we'll do an assessment where we stand. See if there's additional I think we have a video that's available as well. Uh, see if we can do some additional communication outreach. And maybe by the time we come back for development or adoption, we can share some improved numbers and let you know what we're doing. Dr. Robinson. So the 20% are unanswered or no's or both? 20% is no response. Okay. So, I mean, well, it won't solve the problem right now, but I'm just saying in my head, for the start of the school year, when you have to complete the registration, it's not complete until you fill out the form. Like, and it needs to be done electronically and submitted electronically. Um, when have the paper option for those who don't have um, access, but because so, we also need to decrease the workload on data processors, because right. I can't mm -hmm. imagine what it's like just to sit there and enter all that stuff. I'm gonna enter something wrong, right? So, but the other thing um, is on that form is if they click no, 
that there is a, a pop-up that explains the most common concerns about no. Like even if you say yes, we will not give your child vaccines without additional consent or something, whatever you find the most common concerns to be. Um, but then even after that, those who, who say no, I just don't think school-based people should call them. So maybe that pop-up should be, if you have any questions, call Dr. Smith or call somebody, but not the school. Not the school. I don't. I don't think we should put that on the schools. And I don't think. I. I mean. I get. We were in crisis mode because I was getting all those phone calls too, um, from principals and parents about why won't you know the school nurse you know see the baby right, um, but then also be clear in that communication about an emergency. Your even an emergency situation, your child be, will be taken care of. But. Ms. Woodfield brings up a good example. So if the child's nose, nose is bleeding all over the place, what is that? That's not 911. No, but that's first aid. So you could do that without consent? We have okay. made notation and made parents aware that we will provide okay. first it. aid, CPR, and AED. Okay. All right. So anything under first, the banner of first aid is still included without consent. And remember, we're using nursing judgment, too. Yeah, which is why we need to make sure we have nurses. Okay. She just threw that in. And just a quickie, when you said that some of them are not answered, I think we need to know exactly where those children are coming from because maybe parents may not have understood how and what to do with that form. So I would be quite interested in knowing when that 20% could be, they didn't say no or yes, they just didn't fill it out. So we need to know who we're talking about. And as a board member, I would wanna know where and, and who are we talking about so that we can help. We're out in the field all the time and we can help educate parents. And that's what we started this conversation out, is communicating. So I would love to know where it is that people just didn't fill it out so that we can help them. Yes, we have that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Superintendent. Yes, so I'm gonna invite up Ms. Erica Rieger, Chief of HR for our next workshop, which is also a little bit health related. It's uh, policy 3.82, employee protocols in response to communicable diseases, including respiratory virus outbreak, epidemic, endemic, or pandemic. Uh, this policy is nearly a complete rewrite of our original policy that was crafted and uh, and specific to COVID-19 in many areas. So we're trying to rewrite this policy to serve us into the future for whatever we might face. So with that, uh, we also have Jean Marie Middleton, our attorney that's assisting with this policy. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Board Chair, Mr. Barbieri, Vice Chairwoman, Mrs. Brill, board members, colleagues. Uh, thank you, we're pleased to present the revisions to this policy 3.82. Um, as you may know, this policy was developed during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and things have changed. And as of today, uh, many sections within the policy are currently suspended. So these revisions will bring the policy current. Um, the first proposed change is updating the title. Uh, the title is Employee Protocols in Response to Control of Communicable Diseases, including Respiratory Virus, Outbreak and Epidemic, Endemic, or Pandemic. We are proposing we shorten that title to Control of Communicable Diseases Among Employees, and this brings the title in line with our student policy as well. We also are proposing an update to our purpose. We are um, making this in line again with our student policy. Um, this is to facilitate the continuous operations of the district and protect the health, safety, and welfare of employees by allowing for the implementation of prevention, mitigation strategies to diminish the effect of communicable diseases in compliance with CDC, state, and local guidelines during an outbreak epidemic, endemic, or pandemic. Uh, we have added a section on definitions. We've defined communicable disease, epidemics, pandemics, outbreaks, and endemics so that it's clear what these terms mean within the policy. Um, this, this section 
uh, provides information on what administrative procedures can be put in place by the superintendent for the control of communicable diseases, things like instructing employees, providing information on how to detect or prevent uh, the virus, requiring a reporting structure, preparing standards for employees who are returning after recovering from um, a communicable disease, any reports that are needed, and developing programs on how they may pre be prevented or transmitted so that employees have that information. We also kept in place the board notification part of the policy to keep the um, board oversight in place within the policy, providing um, uh, communication from the superintendent to the board, and that uh, was in the is in the current policy, and we're proposing that stay in. We added a section on confidentiality, and we also added information uh, that we will follow the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, added a section that the superintendent shall comply with all applicable federal state laws, executive orders, and health department regulations. We removed, as I mentioned, the currently suspended items. These were very specific towards COVID-19, um, things that are no longer in place, like um, the definition of um, uh, the, uh, the close contact and um, the responsibilities if someone has a positive test. There were reporting requirements and testing requirements and things that were in place that are no longer in place now. Um, so these have been removed. And these, again, were all, are all currently suspended within the policy. And those are the changes that we're proposing to update the policy. Most of them are uh, in line, well, are, were designed to be in line with the student policy so that we have some consistency between the employee policy and the student policy. So the definitions and the purpose and things like that were all updated for that purpose. I'd just like to add, so I mean, this policy does place some faith in the superintendent to react mm -hmm. to these type of situations, to follow federal, state, and local requirements. Uh, we did include that provision that at the next board meeting or as, as soon as humanly possible, I would get back to the board and apprise you of what actions I've taken. Uh, but I think this is needed to be nimble enough to be prepared for whatever future outbreaks might face us. Yes. Any questions or? Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you, Ms. Rieger. Thank you, Ms. Middleton. All right, so that brings us to our last policy workshop, policy 5.50, student education records. So I'm gonna welcome up uh, Ms. Heather Frederick, Chief Financial Officer, and Ms. Kara Rubinson, our General Manager of IT Solutions. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to go over the policy 5.5, the student education records. It's been a while since I've been up here for a policy, so I felt like I needed to get back in the action a little bit. Um, I have uh, Kara Rubinson. She's been working very diligently on this um, policy, as well as our legal phone a friend, Mr. Bruce Harris. Um, he, sh he should be on the, the video and available for questions. So I'm starting the overall purpose of, of what we are trying to, to do here is just to update the policy and have it comply with state and uh, federal uh, rules and, and regulations. And most recently, what I wanna point out is the state rule uh, was actually uh, just recently adopted on October 19th. And so I wanna really thank legal for working with us um, in order to get those changes uh, into this policy presentation. Ms. Rubinson has been working on the policy for several months and then we were able to also incorporate these new changes. And so with these, the, the, the main points of the, uh, the state board rule is that we need to have a review and approval of the online educational service uh, records, which is actually software, online educational service. And it's making sure that all the personal information of the students is protected. And in looking at that, part of what this, the, the new rule and requirement is stating is that the board, um, uh, what the policy, what the rule wants to do is to ensure that every single software that has personal student information is being uh, reviewed by some persons or persons. And so right now, 
we do have a process in place. We've had a process in place that all software is reviewed by the Technology Clearinghouse Committee. And so now we're just adding that within the policy. It's been our current process and we're just adding that uh, to be more explicit within the policy. And then with all other uh, agreements, because there are going to be, um, when you look at the different software agreements, they can range from being free, having no cost, um, to actually having a dollar amount. And so this rule ensures that it doesn't matter what the value is, that it has to go through this process and be reviewed. Um, and so that means that not everything is going to be going to the board. Uh, everything else would follow the uh, policy 6.14, the purchasing department um, guidelines. And most of those contracts and software contracts would fall under the delegated authority. So anything over 25,000 is what would be coming to the board, which is what our current practice has been. So it would just be anything that was less than 25,000 and would just uh, fall uh, and just only go to the Technology Clearinghouse Committee. Where there are some changes and where this policy is a, a little bit different is there's actually a financial impact, if you noticed, uh, with this item. And that's because there is some additional work that's being added on staff. Uh, so we have to, the Technology Clearinghouse Committee is an internal committee uh, with internal staff. It's comprised of IT staff as well as academics because we want to make sure that it's uh, cross-functional. They're looking at all softwares and we need to, the purpose of the committee is making sure that it's not, that it's going to work with our infrastructure, um, that it's going to, to work with, that it has the proper security. Um, and so the, what we have to do is we need to make sure that everything that's not going to the board, so every single software that's being reviewed by the technology committee has to be uploaded on the district website and available for parents to be able to access what that is. In addition to uploading it onto the website, the actual, you know, what the vendor is and the software, uh, what the purpose of it is. Why do they need the personal information? What personal information do they need? That's information that we've always requested. It's on a specific form. Um, that form number is called 2220, which is also attached to uh, the agenda item. And we're making some minor changes to that form to just more explicitly state uh, what the requirements are within the policy. So making sure the information is, is uh, kept confidential, which it had all, has always been, and also being very clear that it cannot be used, none of this information can be used for um, commercial purposes. The third change um, is that, so we're, we're gonna upload, we'll have to upload the actual name of the vendor, the purpose of why this information needs to be used, which is that form 2220. The last piece of it is we have to actually link to the vendor website to the terms and conditions that the vendor is using. Because within that form 2220, there's specific terms and conditions related to privacy that the vendor um, is agreeing to. And this rule wants to make sure that the vendor is actually complying with what they what what they agree to. So we it's not just looking at the form, but it's going to their website and having a link on our website, our district website, to the vendor website to ensure ensure the terms and conditions match what they agree to. And so that is going to be some significant work on the IT side. Um, so we estimate right now that adding two positions between the security department as well as records management, but we're working through you know where's where's the best best place to put those two positions. Let me ask a question, and then sure. Mrs. McQuinn wanted to ask a question. This is a question for the general counsel. My understanding in my discussions with you is that the new statute or the new rule requires, not that I want to do it, or I'm sure my colleagues don't either, that any contract that involves an outsider having identifiable, identifiable student information must be approved by the board. We're, we're being told that it's under 25,000. That's not the discussion you and I had. The, the discussion that you and I had was that when the rule first came out before it went before the hearing, yes. that was something that we were looking at to see if that is in fact what would be voted on by the state board. What ultimately came out to the state board is not that. So where it has landed is that that's not the requirement. And so all of this work that we've been doing, because it was a question mark at one point in time, all this work that we have been doing has been around um, the, the technology end of it so that we can ensure that we are meeting the new requirements in the rule, which does not require that everything come to the board as we had thought it might. Um, and while at the same time, you know, changing the language, making sure that we have the personnel to meet some of the nuances of what is required. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. McQuinn, did you have a question at this point? I have a comment and I apologize to Mr. Burt because typically I would give him a heads up. However, from the previous workshop is what brings this question in terms of adding to staff members. Initially, when I read this, I totally understood it. And so it's not even a request. I'm making a point that we've put additional burdens on school centers, but we don't allocate them additional staff to carry through with that. So it doesn't even reply, it doesn't warrant a comment back, but I think we need to be cognizant of that. Right. Just un understood. We'll look at it. It hasn't been added yet, but uh, we just see <laughs> with these rules uh, that they're putting more and more on our plates. Vice Chair Burrell and then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. And don't get nervous, Ms. Bernard. This is just used as an example. But so in the case of Activate, right, it's under the $25,000, correct? So it wouldn't come to the school board, but it would require it being on the website. Like how would that? How would this policy alleviate the issue that came up with Activate? Well, this rule, this rule didn't exist at that time, right? right. I understand that. So, this rule now, and if we implement, and if we implement the policy, it now has a technology committee that then would review all of that. And they would ensure, as I understand it, that it gets onto the website. Um, in the form 2220, uh, which was completed in the case of Activate, that they would, they would be take part in seeing that portion of it all the way through, uh, but it still would not come to the board because it would be under the threshold. So it was just my follow-up then is that yes, no matter what the cost is of the program, if there's student information to be shared, it would go on the website, whether it comes to us or not. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. That, that is that correct. Is correct. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Harris. <laughs> Voice from above. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and for the benefit of the public, the public, I think it's uh, timely that we talk about the uh, Technology Clearinghouse Committee. I'm always very impressed with the folks that sit on that committee. I, th I think all of, of the board members have someone and how often they meet and how they really delve into what we do here at the school board. So can you kind of give the, the public a little bit about these outstanding people that volunteer their services to make sure that we are following process procedures and trying to do the right thing to protect our district as well as our student records? So we actually have um, two committees um, under IT. So we have the Technology Advisory Committee, which is comprised of um, volunteers with expertise within technology. <laughs> Um, you're going to see the chair of the committee is going to be uh, part of the tech plan um, presentation. They give their time um, to, to review all the technology the district implements, and they just do a, an outstanding job. We also have the Technology Clearinghouse Committee, which is comprised of nine personnel. Of, they're actually district staff. So it's district IT staff as well as staff from the academic side and ed tech. Because uh, when a school is asking to use a certain software, uh, we need to make sure that, because that one school might not realize that we're using it at another school, or that we might have a better product that we're using. And we want to make sure that it integrates with our, uh, with our infrastructure, as well as meets all of our security requirements. So any type of software goes through this internal committee, um, and then is also reviewed by the legal department um, prior to the, the contract being executed. So with the collaboration of, of both of those committees, um, the technology, it really keeps us on, on the forefront of having the best technology uh, within our district. All right, you want to continue? Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Rubinson to, to finish up the, all the other changes, which is what we actually started with before this rule was just approved. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, just some specifics about what we changed um, in the language of the policy. Um, we added a language that clarified what records are electronic and what records are pa paper. I heard um, Dr. Robinson talk about the student registration form. That is an, a perfect example of that. We have the intent of, of hopefully having a electronic version of the re registration form by s hopefully spring of next year, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure of the timeline. But, um, and then the student cumulative folders is the another project that, that I'm very excited about that we have recently embarked on that we are 
digitizing all of the cumulative folders and the contents in those folders for all of our elementary schools. Now that's a two-year project just to do the elementary schools. So in that two-year period, we need to have a policy that, that ha can handle both paper records and electronic records. Some schools are having paper cumulative folders, some schools will have electronic, so the policy needs to be able to um, can, you know, handle both of those scenarios. Um, section two, we added um, the board policies that, that are related to policy 5.50. There are a significant number because the topic is records and information. It's, it touches so many areas. Um, the definition section I think is really important now. We expanded to add definitions of category A information, category B information, and student PII, and of course the online educational services. Um, this policy is quite lengthy and quite complex, so I think the definition section is, is quite important there. Um, in section six, we actually removed the fee schedule. We already have a fee schedule in policy under policy 2.041 under public records, so it, it made sense to us to simply refer to that one rather than trying to keep two that are in sync. And um, section 11, we added a new official school officials access section that um, helped to clarify some requirements under FERPA. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I don't know that I need to go over every of these sections. I think you can read some of them yourself. I do want to point out section 17 is the updated records transfer um, requirements. That's um, specifically talking about threat assessments and unsubstantiated threat assessments. This is the first time in, in rule and, and policy for us that we are saying that Threat assessments do follow a student when they leave our school district and we send the records to the new school district and threat assessments do follow them as well as you probably know. Um, however, unsubstantiated threat assessments would not follow the student un unless they met certain conditions. So that is um, outlined in section 17. Um, that's pretty much it. We, we deleted some redundant content that is, is now available in policy 2.34 that was recently updated, but that's um, pretty much it. If you have any other questions, we'll be happy to answer those. Mrs. Andrews? Do we have anything for the IEP? Um, I didn't see it listed here. There's nothing that needs to be specific to the IEP in, in student records. It's just, it's another student record like many others. Yeah. Is, is it still paper or are we? Well, the IEP is in ed plan, mm -hmm. so, so no. I mean, I'm sure the, the older versions before ed, ed plan existed are still on paper, but, but no, it's, it's in ed plan. And so mm -hmm. it is electronic and everything now. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Frederick, stay close by. We've got one last workshop, the five-year technology plan. So I'm going to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Deepak Argawal and our IT all-stars. You know, these guys, uh, we approved our district five-year plan, and they said we're not going to be outdone by the district. We're going to create our own five-year plan to support you all, and that's, that's what they've done here today. These are the brainiacs of the district. These are. This is a, a lot of brain power assembling at the table, trying to hang on to all these folks. They're in high demand. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ms. Frederick. All right, so we're going to be presenting the five year uh, tech plan and is going to be presented to the board for uh, approval at the December 7th meeting. So it will be on your De uh, De uh, December 7th uh, board agenda. Um, like I mentioned before, which in the, the previous presentation, we really have been on the forefront in terms of technology in our district, and we really do owe that to the leadership of Mr. Ar Argawal. Um, he is the reason why we have a five-year tech plan, and that's something that he implemented when he started. And I just wanna give them credit because the reason why we were able to pivot so quickly during COVID and go and, and um, uh, put out to schools nearly 100,000 or to students nearly 100,000 devices in a two month period so that students could continue to learn is because we had this tech plan and we had it as a goal to have a one-to-one -one devices and we were able to have the foundation in place in order to make that happen. So Mr. Arvall. Thanks, Ms. Uh, Frederick. Um, I'd like to uh, 
say uh, good afternoon to our chair Barbary, Vice Chair uh, Burrell, Superintendent Burke, and the rest of the board members. Uh, this tech plan basically is uh, as good as your team basically. So I want to introduce my team, uh, Michael Callahan, uh, Director of PMO, uh, Chris Prasad, Director of Tech Ops, uh, Ray Usler, Director of IT Security, David Atwell, Director of EdTech, reports under Mr. Vargas, uh, and Don Pumphrey, uh, Director of Enterprise Applications. So without these people, uh, this is not, this is not, this not going to be possible. So this uh, specifically, uh, this tech plan will entail, uh, you know, first we're going to talk about what we have done in that past tech plan, uh, what we're going to be doing the future tech plan, and also highlight mainly our key projects basically going forward. So this tech plan is uh, nothing but is a roadmap for uh, really our technology initiatives and what we're going to be doing for our students and our schools to make sure we're uh, working in conjunction with our district strategic plan that Mr. Burke has and um, kind of better prepare students for future academic and personal success. Um, idea is we wanna make sure that we wanna provide the best technology to make sure our students uh, being part of the digital transformation are able to um, you know, uh, have all the success in the future. So these are the projects we did basically uh, in the last tech plan and noteworthy Ms. Frederick already said about student one-to-one -one devices. Uh, we also did our SIS replacement. We also did many cybersecurity improvements over the years. Um, and I know David Atwell and his team did the interactive classrooms and IT helped as well. So kind of like many, many initiatives were done and completed on time and, and under budget thanks to the PMO. So we were able to uh, work with uh, EdTech and uh, our schools, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Mr. Atwell to go over a few slides um, on the EdTech. Excellent, thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Board Chairman Barbieri, um, Vice Chairwoman Brill, uh, Board Members, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the great work that we've been doing and plan to do. My name is Dr. David Atwell, and I'm the Director of Educational Technology for the District. This strategic plan really has been a continuation of the great work done through the previous technology plan. We have done, um, as we've done in the past, um, we're collaborating with the Division of Teaching and Learning to ensure that it meets the needs of all students to increase digital literacy and academic achievement. The plan discusses the future of technology and its impact on academic disciplines. Um, some of the areas that are impacted are students with disabilities, ELLs, library media, STEM and coding, college and career readiness, virtual education, and course and credit recovery. Uh, the classroom envelope is guaranteed for every teacher and student in Palm Beach County. The image on the left shows a typical classroom setup with a teacher laptop, document camera, projector, smart interactive flat panel and audio enhancement system. The image in the middle and the photograph of a classroom at Verde Elementary on the right shows the next iteration for the elementary school classrooms where the projector and screen have been replaced with a second wall mounted smart interactive flat panel. We continue to improve our spaces as we build out our new schools, listening to feedback and modifying plans accordingly so you can expect this model to adjust and evolve as time goes on. And with that, thank you for your time. Pass it back to Pete. So next, next chart is basically, I wanna uh, commend our tech chair, Mr. Dwayne Piper, who's a CIO from South, South, Water, Florida, uh, South Florida Water Management. So his, his and the rest of the tech members have helped uh, give their feedback on preparing our infrastructure and our internet demands and uh, what storage we need and uh, many of the technologies we, we, uh, we have provided to schools and our teachers and our students and our employees. And so over the, so you can see the growth over the years and um, we, have, we have kept up with the pace and thanks to board and, and superintendent to provide us all the means basically to, to address all those needs. So the next five years strategic priorities, specifically we wanna make sure our, as we have done the digital transformation, we wanna have the classroom to be digital, to be able to work with ed tech, so they have the right tools in place, 
they have all the resources uh, as, far, as far as students and teacher goes. We are one-to-one -one school district now, and so we want to make sure we continue that path. Additionally, we are working very hard on the cybersecurity. We have a, a closed, closed door security workshop uh, with you on, on, on December 7th, so we will be providing you more details on that. And we also want to make sure that all our administrative systems like PeopleSoft and um, you know, SIS and ER, you know, all our HCM system, they're all up to date and, um, and with, with not only the upgrades, but also with, with the right infrastructure. Um, so for the first time since I've been here, all our IT budgets have been fully um, funded, thanks to Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Frederick, I appreciate it, and Dr. Ms. Brennan Burke. So we have, we have uh, classified into three areas. So as you can see, uh, all our IT and ET budgets have uh, 462 million basically in the five years to spend to make sure we are, uh, you know, making sure we have the right refresh, we are right on the technology path, make sure our students and our schools are, and our teachers have the right technology in their hand and also infrastructure to support. I think the last slide we have on ED8. So as you can see, uh, we get uh, ED8 reimbursement. I think uh, for the first time we put down like seven applications for uh, next five years and all seven are approved. And, um, and, and you can see uh, EDIT, FCC, USAC allow us uh, uh, much more bandwidth now as, as far as application goes, but you know, as we're, we're, we're I think that they have also, in the five-year plan, uh, the, the way they are doing priority one and priority two is basically more not on the per school basis, but as a district basis. And we get like around 80% of our investment back on bandwidth, uh, bandwidth and our network devices and, and many of the technology we use to make sure we have the right broadband capabilities. So with that, I will we'll be here for the questions. Sorry. I'll take the question. in order that you had your hands up. Mrs. Andrews, Mrs. Mrs. Whitfield, and Ms. Ayala. Wow. Uh, I want to thank you all. I think you're a super team here, uh, Deepak. I mean, you've been here with this district. I see you're an outstanding team. I think about you when I travel to the schools and I see the equipment, the computers in every classroom, and how, Mrs. Frederick, you put that money together and we ordered all those computers and I was waiting with bated breath to get them in the Glades region. I picked up the phone and I called you and it seems like the computers just came just like that. And when we think about you know, all of the things that happened to us during the pandemic, working closely with EdTech, you made it happen. I wanna thank our community uh, partners who worked with us. So when we talk about you know, uh, being able to have connectivity in all of the communities that needed it, it was your people, I saw you and you got it done. And I thank you for taking us to the next level in Palm Beach County. When I see the smart boards and I see the presentations everywhere, I just saw all of the great presentations at West Tech. Everywhere I'm walking, I see you and I think about you <laughs> and what you do. And we're just so thankful to have a team with the cybersecurity. I can't go through all of this because you're just awesome. You haven't missed the beat. And I know my fellow board members want to say thank you for keeping us updated on task especially for our children, our employees, to make sure that we don't miss a beat. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield? Thank you. I, I just, just like Mrs. Andrews, wanted to thank you for your work. When we look at our scores that we have in Palm Beach County compared to the rest of the state, um, we're doing really well considering what we all went through. And so I give a lot of that credit, um, kind of nobody thinks about it, but the fact that we were able to pivot so quickly because of the computers you were able to give to our students so they could actually work from home. So I wanna, I wanna give you that credit publicly and just say thank you so much for keeping us going because a lot of other communities wish that they had had that ability uh, that we had and it's, it's due to all your hard work. So thank you so much. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm gonna have some questions, so I'm gonna preemptively ask for opportunity for back and forth. Thank you. Um, first, wanna say thank you all for the hard work. It's really robust. Um, my appointee, Kathy Myron, gave me a full report on the work that you've all been doing on this, so I wanna thank her as well for her time. Um, I want to say great job keeping the budget in great shape, especially with the large influx of products and technology that we've been adding in our classrooms. Really testament to everybody who's on the team. Um, and then I had some questions about 
some of the things I saw in the packet. Um, first, I want to say thank you for eSports. I can't say how many times I go to a school and the students come up to me and say, how do we start a club? Can you help us? And they're excited about it. But we know that with the gaming, there comes risks if you're live gaming and different things that we need to protect our students from. So I'm glad that we're thinking about that. Question, are we thinking about virtual reality and augmented ed as we look at the future of what education could look like? Right, Mr. Apto. Um, yes, so, <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> you know, we have, we have district standard, right? And we, we do need to make sure that all the systems that we put in place work with our, work with our systems. And at the other side of that, we have cutting edge. Um, VR has been, you know, career and technical education has been playing with that for quite, quite a number of years, whether you talk about the old vSpace um, units that, that those are probably about six years old now. Um, I know some of the headsets have come in to, to enter into that space as well. Um, you know, there's some technical issues because um, a lot of the programs are actually built on the one that is owned by Facebook and trying to make sure that these systems will work yeah. within our space. But we are actually looking into that, obviously, with, um, with these teams and with curriculum as well to, to try and impact that. There's a couple things um, that we're currently looking at in that area, yes. Thank you for that answer, that's great. I was just really excited to see that. Um, next, I had questions about cloud usage. Are we using it, protection? Um, so we'll start there and then I have a follow up regarding that. So yeah, I think the same question was asked in the TAC last TAC and I answered the same way. So we have over the years, you know, if you see the our instruction material application, mostly they're SaaS based applications. We have been always been using cloud. Other than that, we do use, um, you know, I, mean, I can disclose here overall, but we do use AWS as our cloud choice and we have some, uh, also some um, workloads going into Azure we are working on a few other technologies right now to make sure we have a proper disaster recovery in the cloud. So okay. I'm just going to stop here. We can okay. talk more in the closed session if you want. That's great. And my follow-up was regarding the hits that we've seen to governmental agencies where they request ransom after gathering your information. What's the protection for those risks that we have in place? So we will talk more about that in the cybersecurity closed session. Okay. Great. Um, and then last question on this. Um, I really love the trainings for phishing. I actually um, had one come through. It was the Amex bill, that you, and that was great. Um, what do we have on trainings for info sharing when folks attempt hacking, right? For our employees who are our first line of defense and protecting their credentials to access to all the portals that we have internally, um, are there trainings around? Can you t tell me a little bit about that? So we have an annual security awareness training which covers all those topics, and okay. we urge everybody here to take that training and, and we'd like to protect every employee to make sure that they, they learn every chapter and Ray's pretty big on that and every day reminds me, give me their stats and take it to Heather and show it to Ms. Ms. Hedricks to show, you know, and I think we're gonna be talking in our departments also to make sure um, district is 100% um, compliance basically, compliant I would say. Yeah, because hackers are getting incredibly sophisticated. Correct. Thank you so much. Yep. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to veer off topic just a wee bit because I know um, my questions will not really be technically housed in your area, but you are the computer whizzes and I need more from the computer whizzes for the children, right? So um, the first question I have, and. I don't know, I guess you got credit for the one-on-one, -on -one, so this, I think, belongs to you. What, what is the status of children taking home devices now? So I think the way, it, the, every child should be able to take the, the computer home. So it's a one -on, it, we are one-on-one -on -one district, and every school has computer for every, every student to take home. And it's okay. on, up to the school how they implement that policy. Okay. And so my request, Mr. Superintendent, is that you follow up on that so principals know that that's kind of the expectation that... Yes, we've, we've navigated some issues when, now that we have the progress monitoring, monitoring testing three times a year, there's a, a hesit, I mean, there's a, principals like to hang on to their devices, so they may go through periods where they say, look, we don't want the devices going home, we wanna make sure we have them on hand for testing. Uh, we're trying to avoid creating any inequities by you know, 
doing that. And um, Mr. Tierney and I have worked through some individual cases. And when it gets to our attention, we say, hey, make sure the kids are able to take the devices home. Uh, but I probably need to do a little more homework on that one and get back to you because it, it seems like it's a little, uh, it's a mixed bag. It is, it is. I mean, I'm aware of a kindergartner who is taking his device home and it was just what they do at that school. Now this is a um, inner city school, right? And so I think that they may recognize that some of their students, maybe many of their students might not have access at home, but then we have children in more affluent schools who don't have access at home and we're equity embedded system, we said. So if we could just follow up on that. We will. Okay. The, the one thing that's been a real challenge with that program is the amount of breakage we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that's been part of the motivation to try to keep devices on campus, but we're working through that. Okay. So, um, okay, I'm gonna leave that part alone. And so then, um, the in terms of the images you showed about the technology changes in the classroom, do, so you have a model for what technology should look like in, for example, an elementary classroom? Yes, and so will we be working to ensure that every classroom in every school, is that part of your five-year plan to, to get them to that point instead of just the new schools? I believe so. I believe so, absolutely. Um, yes, we, um, right now those, um, the classroom envelope is in each of the schools. Now, of course, we do have, as time goes on, um, for example, a document camera, some teachers might not prefer to use the document camera, take it off their desk, or we might be doing a refresh on a product, such like a document camera or a projector. But yes, we're constantly refreshing these things, keeping them up to date. But as far as the list of those items, those are what we do have in the classroom right now. Okay, so then I misunderstood you because the slide that you showed with, with the three pictures, mm -hmm. So I thought that you said that the third picture, which I don't remember which school it was, had some brand spanking new formulation of technology in it. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in new construction, in, in some of the new schools that we've been doing, um, basically they have, in ed of, instead of adding another uh, projector, um, we've added a modern smart panel on the front instead of doing the projector in it's very cost prohibitive to go back into all schools and do that um, because you do have that second uh, display already with the projectors so what we're doing is we're upkeeping the fleet that we already have with the projectors to make sure that functionally um, instructional wise the teachers do have those dual displays it's just on new construction there, there's a couple of efficiencies on why it's actually beneficial to add a panel or a screen on the front. Um, it's backlit, it's easier for kids to see from further, um, but it, we're maintaining our fleet that we have in the other schools. Okay, I'll follow up with that later in a different way. And so, um, and then I just want to throw in, since you are the technology experts, that I would hope that each of you, that you're individually and collectively pushing into the academic program to make sure that we are developing our young people to be more like you, right? Um, that we have um, like introduction to coding in like across the board. And I know you're not the academic people. I know, you know, you had to talk to Choice and whoever, right? But you guys know what it should look like. And you guys know, gals too, sorry, um, know the steps to get there, right? And so I'm just gonna, I'm just requesting that you push in with the academic people to make sure that that, that development's taking place. Cause like I told some of the young people, people who run computers will run the world and you know it's true, right? And so we need to develop more of them in Palm Beach County. And my last question is, um, now I'm gonna make it a comment. I hope that you will continue the summer intern program mm -hmm and that you do a, um, I don't know what it's called, like a development pathway. So you know how they do like in baseball and then they have like the minor league, the training camp. I need you to not just take the kids who are already rocking it, but to take the kids who have a high interest, who are willing to raise their hand and you inspire them to rock it, okay? Thank you. 
And so now I'm the next one to speak, so I will, I'm actually not asking any questions, I just want to comment. I want to tell you that your department is absolutely a model for the state and a model nationally. And from the simplest level, um, the annual training. You know, when I get all the notices to do my annual training, I usually roll my eyes. Well, I have to tell you that your training has taught me so much that twice my husband's business was hacked, and I told him when I do it again, you're gonna sit with me because you're going to have to watch to understand what you don't click on because the, and that will prevent you from having those problems. And the way that you've all responded to the cybersecurity threats, really, it truly is a model. I'm just very impressed. I thank you for your responsiveness all the time because no matter how silly my question may be, I get responses right away. And I hear that from everybody all the time. So I just really wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And none of you are ever allowed to leave us. Okay, thank you. Well, going last after six ladies, I just can say ditto six times. <laughs> um, I, I do want to also compliment you. It's, it's a ways back, and Deepak, I'm not sure which of these people at the table participated, but I remember at West Boca High School, um, my grandson's in the Computer Science Academy, and um, and there was not a professor or a teacher available. And I know somebody from the IT department filled in and, and taught those children until they were able to get a teacher. So I want to thank you for helping the kids in our schools in situations like that, too. So thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you. It, it doesn't get any better than that, IT team. So <laughs> we will rest our case. And that concludes our workshops. Thank you. Motion to adjourn the workshop. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. All right, I'll call the special meeting to order at, what time is it? 4 11, 4 11 p.m. Uh, Ms. Pilato, would you please take the roll? District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. All right, we have quorum with all seven board members in attendance. The record should also reflect that we have with us Superintendent Burke, General Counsel Bernard, Inspector General Michael, and Board Clerk Tony Bellata. Would you all please stand for the pledge to be led by Ms. Ayala. Before we look at number two on the agenda, it's, it's time to recognize that Mrs. McQuinn will be celebrating her 50th birthday in, in two days. <laughs> so happy birthday, Mrs. McQuinn. <laughs> Board members, we have four sets of minutes on the agenda. We need a motion to approve them. Motion by Ms. Ayala, second by Mrs. Whitfield. Any discussion? All in favor, opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have no items to add for good cause. Superintendent, do you have any items to withdraw? No, sir. Board members, you wish to pull anything from the agenda? We need a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. There are any disclosures or abstentions? Seeing none, Mr. Superintendent, do you have comments? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Mr. James Gavrilos, President and CEO of the Education Foundation of Palm Beach County, along with his team, our student staff, and the whole community that came out on Saturday for the eighth annual Heroes for Education Run Walk. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, raised some money for a good cause there with uh, teacher supplies and our, throughout our schools. And we've got a, a brief video I'd like to share tonight. The Palm Beach County School District community played a big part in this annual event at John Prince Park to celebrate people with Down Syndrome. Welcome to the Downright Extraordinary Walk. Hi, my name is Connie Tiba. I am so excited to be here. Well, it is a beautiful day today because without all these people, I don't know where I'd be without them. Friends and family join teachers and therapists like this group from 
Frontier Elementary School. This Fab Four and Duncan came out to support Grayson. We're here for our kids all the time in school and outside of school. We love being there for them. We love supporting them. We're a family and us being out here out of school just shows them that. There were also large and supportive teams for Jackson from Park Vista. Who are we? Harrison and Sunday from Timber Trace Elementary. Nicholas from Boca Raton Community High. Marco from Golden Grove Elementary. Victoria from Santa Lucia's Community High. And birthday girl Anna from Jupiter Community High. Happy birthday, dear Anna. The walk is another example of the dedication and commitment the Palm Beach County School District makes to support students with special needs. Every day we walk into the district office, we know that we're there for the students. That's our main concern. Together, all these superheroes raise more than $170,000 for the Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization. I was crying because Buddy Walk means all these people, all the amazing love I have. All right. Well, that was not the video I expected, but that was a great video nonetheless. Uh, I think we'll, I'll keep moving ahead. If we get a chance, we'll go back to the other one. Uh, was it last night? Yeah, I guess it was last night. We had the college and career fair out at the fairgrounds. Uh, we, we think we had about 3,300 people come out, parents, students. Uh, we had, I think, about 80 uh, booths on display with various colleges and universities, also career and technical education programs, our armed services, and uh, all kinds of options for our high school students as they consider what they want to do after graduation. So that was a big success. And then uh, also I just wanted to mention that, uh, let's see. Okay, how could I forget this? We got an important uh, question on about November 8th, the election's fast approaching. And just a reminder that uh, what we're trying to do here is continue what was originally approved in 2018. It's a tax levy already in place that's having a huge impact on our schools with school safety, mental health, art, music choice, career programs, and improving teacher pay. Uh, if you're interested in more comments from me, you can tune in on Sunday to To The Point with Michael Williams, and I'll be talking a little bit more. Uh, other than that, are we, do we have a video ready there? We think so. All right, let's roll the dice, board. Here's uh, the, the Heroes for Education Run Walk. Good morning, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you out again. Heroes for Education 5K Run. So excited to have you all out here. Thank you for being such a great part of this annual event, benefiting the teachers here in the school district of Palm Beach County. People ask me what the goal of our Heroes of Education 5K is. Yeah, we want to raise funds so we can support teachers and students. But here's the goal. We've got a thousand people out here today, and they're having a ball. A lot of these guys are behind me. This is the Polo Park Middle School team. We've had a bunch of employees here, chairman of the board, multiple school board members, and uh, we're just having a good time this morning. The turnout today has been great. Um, the support for our public education is fantastic. Our incredible sponsors are here. Our chairman of the board, DJ Jim Moore, has got this crowd rocking. We've got mascots getting ready to run. We've got kids getting ready to do a 100-yard dash. There's a 1,000 people here having a great time, celebrating teachers, students, education, and Palm Beach County. What more could you ask for? All right. That was a lot of fun. So that uh, concludes my comments. Mrs. McQuinn, Ms. Ayala, Mrs. Whitfield. We can always count on you, Mrs. Andrews. Yeah, and just a quickie, uh, you know, we're into the uh, arena right now for fall sports, and I just want to say thank you to the coaches, to the students, to the parents. I see you all out there at the games, all of the football games, the other uh, fall sports. Uh, I see you uh, winning trophies, uh, Wellington and Palm Beach Central just uh, created a big game just the other night, and Palm Beach Central took the trophy back from Wellington. I just know that it takes a lot to be in academics as well as in sports. And I just want to thank all the teachers, the coaches, the families, and the athletes for what you do. You're athletic, 
athletics as well as academics go right in hand and it makes you truly exciting. I look at you on television on Channel 5 late at night to see what's going on since I can't make every game and you're awesome. Thank you for having such a wonderful, wonderful experience in Palm Beach County academically, uh, athletically, socially, and emotionally. And thanks for all you do, parents, coaches, teachers, schools, and staff for making it happen in Palm Beach County. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Dr. Robinson, Ms. Brill. I just want to thank this morning, the superintendent and I attended a, uh, uh, the first annual Consular Appreciation Breakfast put on by the George Snow Scholarship Fund, and they invited the uh, the consulars from the high schools in the district. So it was a, a great uh, a great morning. The first annual. Uh, hopefully, they'll be doing it every year. At least that's what the plan is. But I want to thank Tim Snow and the, and the board of the George Snow Scholarship Fund for recognizing that our consulars are some of the most important people in our high schools. So, thank you. Um, we have uh, several, several, we have 13 agenda item speakers. Um, are we connected to the Glades? Are we connected to the Glades? Fine. Yes. Okay, Mayor Wilson, Mayor Bell Glade. Uh, Vice Mayor Amazon, the city of Bell Glade. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, good afternoon all to Superintendent Berg and all school board members and Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Joaquin Almazan, Vice Mayor of the Bell Glade, and I'm in support of naming the new high school uh, to be considered for Dr. Joaquin Garcia. Uh, Mr. Garcia, we know he was a great Hispanic advocate, and not just Hispanic an advocate for all kids here in Palm Beach County. And uh, hopefully y'all consider this vote and take his consideration for Hispanics kids out here to have a mentor they can look up to on a school. So we appreciate your support if y'all can support that. Uh, Mayor of South Bay, uh, Joe Kyles was here, but he had a leave and he's also in support. So I thank you for the time and consideration for this. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, Mayor Keith Babb from the city of Pahokee. Uh, uh, he's not here. He couldn't make it. Okay. Dr. Carlos Diaz, come up to the podium. Wait, wait, let's get a microphone over there. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board and superintendent. All of you know me, but for the record, I am Dr. Carlos Diaz, chairman of the Hispanic Education Coalition of Palm Beach County and professor emeritus in the College of Education at Florida Atlantic University. I, along with many supporters, are here to urge you to name Triple O High School after my predecessor as chairman of the Hispanic Education Coalition, Dr. Joaquin Garcia. I could list Joaquin's many accomplishments as a physician, immigrant, businessman, community, and education advocate. Joaquin's life was a true Horatio Alger story. I will not do so because this board did an excellent job of recognizing them in the proclamation you issued posthumously honoring Joaquin's life in December of last year. At that meeting, I addressed the board and said that a fitting tribute to Joaquin's passion for greater equity in the education of all students in Palm Beach County would be to name the future Triple O High School after him. Well, that day is today, and I'm back to implore you to do so. Board members are aware that Hispanics at about 37% represent the largest plurality of students served by the district. Their parents are the largest constituency of that population, and Hispanic students generate the largest share of tax revenue for this school district. Yet in the history of the Palm Beach County schools, of the 180 or so schools in the district, no school has ever been named after a Hispanic individual. 
that dubious historical fact can end today. It is true that the naming of the school is a symbolic act. The graduation or achievement rate will not automatically go up with the naming of a new school. Yet I would like to stress that it is a very important symbolic act, especially to the Latino community of Palm Beach County. I cannot overstate the significance of the support and pride in the Hispanic community to know that one of us is being considered by this board with the honor of having a school named after him, an honor which will endure in perpetuity. The Hispanic Education Coalition has asked supporters of naming Triple O High School after doc Dr. Joaquin Garcia to attend today's meeting wearing white shirts or blouses. This is to provide a visual image of the broad support for naming the school after Joaquin. You will hear from some of these individuals during the citizen comment section of this meeting. We have also asked those who support this naming but could not be here to contact board members to express their support. I'm sure you've received a number of emails, voicemails, messages, or letters to let you know that the support is widespread. Joaquin and I were great friends who collaborated with others on heck policy and actions for over a decade. But our friendship is not the reason I'm here speaking to you today. I have never met someone as committed as Joaquin to educational equity and who was willing to do whatever he could to advance that cause. He did so even if it involved jeopardizing personal popularity or individual resources. He always told me that, quote, the needs of the students must come first, and he meant it literally. Joaquin fully understood the significance of fighting for causes that would transcend his own lifetime. That is a very valuable lesson for all of us in this room and for the students in the Palm Beach County Schools. It is a lesson I have taken to heart as I have tried to fill his shoes and honor his great legacy. I hope that in the future, Latino and non-Latino students may wanna know who Dr. Joaquin Garcia was and after whom this school is named. If they follow up on this question, they will find a man who while personally very successful, never lost sight of his good fortune, nor trying to better the lives of others who needed assistance or advocacy. What better message could we send to our current and future students? On behalf of the Hispanic Education Coalition, I urge every member of this board to support the, the naming of Triple O High School after Dr. Joaquin Garcia. The time to make history is today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. Xavier Garcia. Mr. Xavier Garcia, are you here? Javier, I'm sorry, Javier. Ms. Ayala, you have to excuse my mispronunciation. <laughs> no worries. Many people dream about making history. Few, if any, achieve it. Today, you, the board members of the Palm Beach County School District, have been presented with an opportunity to make history. We have the opportunity to step forward and be the first school in Palm Beach County, the 10th largest school district in the nation to name a school after Hispanic. This is not just about making history. This is about celebrating our Hispanic community, the very community that makes up the majority of our student body. I know that many of you work with Dr. Garcia and I am sure each and every one you, of you, experienced firsthand how dedicated and driven he was to improving the quality of education of Hispanic children. For Dr. Garcia, ensuring that each and every Hispanic voice was heard was paramount. Dr. Garcia was a fierce believer in bilingual education. In fact, he was honored with the Medal of Civil Merit by the King of Spain for his volunteer work towards the quality of education and representation of Hispanic children and for promoting the Spanish language in our schools. Dr. Garcia 
was a warrior for anyone who needed his support. And when he saw that the Hispanic community was being left behind, he stood up to stop it. And when people wouldn't listen, he shouted louder. Dr. Garcia fought to ensure that every child got the quality of education that they deserved. He carried only one flag, one sword, one shield. And that was for the Hispanic children of the Palm Beach County School District. The naming of Triple O High School after Dr. Joaquin Garcia will be a moment in local history that people will look back on. People will remember the moment that our school district stepped forward and showed their Hispanic community that their voices have been heard, that they matter. They will remember that we were leaders. I stand before you as a member of the Palm Beach County community for over 30 years. Together, together we have the chance to give our children a role model they can believe in, a true example of how with hard work and determination, anything is possible. A role model that never gave up, fought for justice, and believed in equality. By naming the Triple O High School after Dr. Garcia, you tell children everywhere that making history is possible. Thank you. Green Acres Council Member Susie Diaz. Susie Diaz, I am a council member with the city of Green Acres, and I am here today in support of naming Triple O High School after Dr. Joaquin Garcia. I know I don't have to tell you who he was, you know that. You know he was a fierce advocate. You know at times he was the devil's advocate. And that is how growth happens, when we are challenged, when we are asked to look at a perspective outside of the perspectives that we already know and are comfortable with. Dr. Garcia advocated way beyond education. I was honored to have known him for nearly 25 years. And during that time, I saw him do so much good within our community, which is why I am absolutely asking that you please consider naming the school after him. I know we heard Mr. Diaz mention the 37% Hispanics within our district. One fact I would like to also point out is that where this school will be pulling students from it looks like it's the Palm Springs, Green Acres, Lake Worth sort of unincorporated corridor. Palm Springs is 60% Hispanic, Green Acres is 47% Hispanic, and Lake Worth is 44% Hispanic. So there is a very strong possibility that the concentration of Hispanics at this specific school will be higher than those in another, um, in another area. So for these reasons, for many more, um, again, you all did such a beautiful job honoring him with the proclamation. You, you know who he was, you know what he stood for. And it is so apropos, it is well beyond time as a Florida and Palm Beach County native, I can tell you it is way beyond time that we look at honoring a Hispanic with a school naming. Thank you so much for your time. Mabel Melton. Mabel Melton. Good afternoon. My name is Mabel Melton. I am here to speak in support of naming the Triple Zero School in honor of Dr. Joaquin Garcia. I was privileged to meet Joaquin a number of years ago when my husband and I moved here after our lives spent mostly in Miami. Dusty and I are parents of five children, the youngest turning 34 in December. Don't figure out my age, I'm old enough. Um, and we have always cared passionately about the quality of public education. It is the formative crucible in which many children's lives are forever impacted and improved. And it is an equal opportunity environment that in many respects helps prepare students for adulthood and their lifelong opportunities ahead. That too was Joaquin's view. Joaquin was passionate, fearless, and unrelenting in pursuit of equity and opportunity for all students of our public schools, but especially for Hispanic students who are the largest ethnic plurality in the district. 
He was a beloved community leader, not only in the public education space, and he supported many civic causes with his time, his talent, and his personal resources. With nearly 200 public schools in Palm Beach District, it would be well more than appropriate to name the new school in honor of Dr. Joaquin Garcia, the first Hispanic honoree. This will be a source of enormous pride and inspiration to Latino students who number nearly four out of every 10 in the district and also for the Hispanic faculty and administrators as well. Everyone has heard, everyone you've heard before today has said this is a historic moment and it is. And I urge you all to take part in making history today for it not now, when. Thank you for your consideration. Carmen Garcia. Well, I wasn't gonna speak, but um, there's so much to say in such a short time. Um, Joaquin Garcia was more than just uh, a man who gave 100% of his life to children that he didn't have. I remember him telling me many times, um, I don't have any children of my own, but every single child in the school district is mine. He went above and beyond. When nobody would hear him, he would, as was said before, he would speak louder. And if he had to scream, he would scream. But his most important thing was to always, always make sure that no child was gonna creep through a crack simply because of the color of their skin or simply because of where they came from. He was such an advocate. I was very blessed to work with him, uh, putting the fundraiser together that we did every year, six years in a row. That was the only fundraiser that Hispanic Education Coalition had. And we did anything and everything to be able to get funds for our scholarships. It is history in the making. And I just pray that every single one of you understands how important this is to not only our community, our Hispanic community, but every child that gets an opportunity to see that someone that looked like him or that has a name uh, that they can relate to will be able to see that they are, there's an opportunity for them. and. Um, he always used to tell me, you know, when people think about Hispanics and Latinos, I don't want them to think that we're just about salsa, this and that. No, I want them to understand how deep we go into caring for our community and our children. And um, he didn't want just his, the children, the Hispanic children, to see maybe um, the cleaning lady that looked like them or you know the janitor, or or maybe um, anybody else, or the bus driver, the, he or the cafeteria lady. He wanted to ensure that children would know that administrators in the school district and principals also had last, last names that they could relate to and that would look like him. So yes, please. Today, the last time I spoke with with Joaquin, we laughed and laughed, and it was a joyous, joyous moment. I pray today is a joyous moment. Thank you. Alan Levine. Good afternoon, I'm Alan Levine from West Palm Beach. I met Dr. Garcia 22 years ago. I was volunteering at the Vickers House Crisis Center, working on homeless veterans. And Joaquin came and said, you know, I'd like to work with you on children and families that are homeless. So needless to say, we immediately had a bond. 
Subsequently, I mentioned to Joaquim that my wife has a course that the um, 15th Circuit Court asked her to develop with regard to arrested prostitutes and Johns. And he said he would like very much to be an interpreter at that class and lecture about HIV and AIDS and making those in the street seeking sex aware of what they're bringing home. He wanted to teach. And during the break, he would be one-on-one -on -one with those individuals. And that was most important because sitting in class, listening to an interpreter interpret, you lose track of what's going on. But he made sure that he was available to speak one-on-one. -on -one. He was motivated to achieve. He recommended goals. His focus was on children and families. And his memory for me and others will continue to inspire children and teachers. This was his dream. So I ask you to be, please, please be considerate. Thank you very much. Dr. Gabriela Mendez. Hello, members of the board and superintendent. Uh, I'm Dr. Gabriela Mendez. I'm a faculty at Nova Southeastern University. Um, I'm a member of a community. I've been a mother of a student in the district till a year ago. My, my baby grew up. What can I say that haven't been said so beautifully before me? Very little. So I'm not going to talk about Joaquin. You know him. You appreciate him. So instead, um, I'm going to share a letter of support, or I'm going to tell you who signed this letter of support, naming triple zero doc after Dr. Joaquin Garcia. This letter happens to be signed um, by individuals representing many diverse community organizations who, as Dr. Joaquin Garcia, happen to also belong to the, as he did um, before he passed, they happen to belong to um, a committee of the school district, the Equity and Diversity Committee. This letter of support is signed by the following organizations and their members. Cesar Vigo, Division of Blind Services of Florida. Re Reginald Durandis for the Children Incorporated. Sue, Dav Sue Davis Killian, Gold Coast Down Syndrome Organization. Juan Pagan, Florida Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce. Amanda Canet, Compass LGBTQ Community Center. Julie Saver, Compass LGBTQ Community Center. Amy Kenny, um, Palm, Beach Community, Palm Beach County Human Rights Council. Dr. Gabriela Mendez, Hispanic Education Coalition. They all belong also to the equity, and, and I also belong to the equity and community, um, uh, sorry, equi equity and diversity um, committee. 37% of the students are Latinx in this district. No school is named af after someone who looks, talks, or feel like them. If that's not lack of e equity, I don't know what that is. It's time to change that, and you have the power to do it. Please do it. Thank you. Dusty Melton. Good afternoon, board members and superintendent. Thank you for this opportunity to address you today. You heard a few minutes ago from my wife, Mabel, about our great professional admiration and personal affection for Joaquin. Um, I can't do any better than she can. So I'd like to come at this matter from a very different perspective. Mabel and I were very fortunate to move up to this wonderful community a little under four years ago. 
Um, but I continue to commute by Brightline to downtown Miami every day for my consulting practice of more than 40 years. Most of my clients do government procurement, and that makes me an exquisitely keen student of government process. And I'd like to talk about the process that brought this matter to your agenda today. And in a word, it was exemplary. Triple O had its own dedicated website from a long time ago. The content was importantly bilingual. And the process of evolving through the implementation of your board policy for naming new facilities was followed impeccably. There was a naming committee pursuant to your policy. It held two public meetings. The public participation was robust. The media was there. Both meetings were very well attended. It was the nine member committee was chaired by one of your administrators, Karen Wetzel, who did an outstanding, an outstanding job. And I was particularly impressed at the first naming committee member where not only did Ms. Wetzel talk the community and her eight committee members through what would be the process, but she also did it visually in a 19, very comprehensive 19 page PowerPoint that laid out the policy, laid out the committee members, laid out the procedure, laid out the required by your policy history of the area that the school will serve. It was just an outstanding and very transparent and informing to the public process. The second meeting, she did a remarkable job as the facilitator, taking scores of potential names, many of them quite peculiar, and culling the list down to the final three that are before you today. I've been doing government process for more than four decades. It's my day job. I rarely use the word flawless to describe a government process. And I think you all understand what I'm saying. I use that word today. And therefore, because I do believe this was a flawless process that produced outstanding results, I urge you, as all the other speakers have, to embrace your superintendent's recommendation. Thank you. Denise LeBlanc. Denise LeBlanc. I can't see you around the corner there. I don't know if you're coming up or not. Good afternoon. My name is Denise LeBlanc. I am a retired, longtime Palm Beach District teacher and ESOL coordinator. I worked at Forest Hill for many years as the ESOL coordinator, coordinator working principally with Latino youth. Um, I've spoken with a few of them, a few of my former students, um, over this period when the choice for the naming of the new school would be made. And it was pretty much a consensus of my former students, principally Latino, that it would be cool to have a school, the new school, named after Dr. Joaquin Garcia. I know you're all aware of his many attributes and what a great local hero he is. What better way to honor him than name the new school, which will be uh, a Latino majority, it sounds like, and uh, to give these young people someone to look up to and to inspire them. So it is my hope that the name Dr. Joaquin Garcia will be selected for the new school. Thank you. Our last speaker is DeAndre Poole. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Dr. DeAndre Poole and I stand here in support of Triple O being named after Dr. Joaquin Garcia. Dr. Garcia and I work together as counterparts. I served as chair of the Coalition for Black Student Achievement for many years. And um, he and I served on the academic, academic advisory committee together, as well as the diversity and equity committee together for the school district. And I got to know him extremely well. And he was a tireless advocate. So I just want to just end my comments by saying that 
I support every speaker that has spoken thus far and everything that they have said, and I hope that you will as well. Thank you. Board members, we have five uh, items on consent. Does anyone want to pull any of those? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Ms. Ayala. Any discussion? All in favor? <clears throat> Opposed motion carries 7-0. Superintendent, REGC1, naming of high school, triple O. Yes, I recommend the school board approve the naming of the new high school, triple O, from the list of recommendations submitted in order of preference as follows. Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School, Western Wave High School, and Park Ridge High School. We have a motion, Ms. Ayala. I move to name Triple O High School, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School as the top selection. Do we have a second? All six? <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Mrs. Andrews. Yes, I'd like to make a statement uh, before uh, we move forward. Uh, it's a great day today. Uh, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School sits at the eastern, the southeastern portion of District 6. And I must say, I knew Dr. Joaquin Garcia. I worked with him representing this school board on HEC and he was my friend. It is a great day today for a great man who truly loved children. He especially worked so hard for our Hispanic children. His leadership with the Hispanic Education Coalition was above reproach. His work with our schools and our communities to provide equity and access to our children and community is lasting. His legacy lives on in the work that we will do as we move forward with this new school. The naming of the school is well deserved so that we celebrate today. We think about all of the work that he has done. It makes us all proud. He was one who gave his all for the betterment of others. It is a special day, a historic day in District 6 with the School District of Palm Beach County, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School. Great day. <laughs> Vice Chairwoman Brill. So Mrs. Andrews, you know that that school, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School, sits in the corner of District <laughs> 6, so five. five I'm getting totally confused. Six, six, six. thank you. Um, but we will be sharing the students that go there. And I do want you to know, we've said it when we had the proclamation and the memorial, how good a friend Dr. Joaquin Garcia was to me. What I will share is that when Ms. Ayella mentioned that she was going to run for school board or thinking about it, the first thing I said to her was, I need to introduce you to Dr. Garcia. And so I did. And so his legacy lives on through you, Ms. Ayella and through the naming of the school, and I could not be any prouder to be sitting up here for this naming. Thank you. Of course, Ms. Ayal, I'm sure you have some words you like to. I just wanna take a moment to thank every community leader who's here today for coming, for your energy, for your organization. Um, this is an emotional day for so, much of us, so many of us. Um, Joaquin was a mentor to me, a friend, I know that um, I would not be here if it had not been for the hard work he did for decades um, to make it possible, and many of you in this room, for a Hispanic Latino individual to even run for the school board. Um, you know, the fact that 
it is the first elected representative and it happened in 2020 shocks many people in other parts of the state and the country. So to have that honor and know that it was because of the hard work he did and standing on his shoulders means the world to me. And I'm just excited that we get this opportunity to our students to be able to identify somebody they can look up to who had a trajectory of professionalism and leaves behind a legacy that anybody would want to emulate of giving back to your community, of being a public servant and of really investing in the future, which is public education and our children. So it is an honor for me this today. I can't wait to um, celebrate this with all of you later. Con mi familia de heck. Thank you all so much. And I want to give a shout out to the principal, Oscar Otero, who is here today. Would you like to come? We're coming up. Yes, okay. I'm going to call them up. I'm going to call them up. We, we have uh, Ms. Haynes, the regional superintendent, and also Oscar Otero to speak. Good evening. I had, I guess this is not on. Good evening. I um, had the three names prepared for you tonight, so that is off the table. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity um, to, to see you tonight and also to be able to let you know that Mrs. Wetzel is here as well, as we've heard such amazing things about Mrs. Wetzel tonight. We're very proud of her work. And also wanted to give you an opportunity or give Mr. Otero, our principal of Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School, an opportunity to, uh, to speak and address the board. Uh, I'll use yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, board members, superintendent. Um, I guess it'll be exciting for the first time to call it the official from the principal's uh, microphone. Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School. There we go. Uh, we're excited and we just thank you for, for the work, for the support. And as you know, we're working diligently to open what will be Palm Beach County's best high school in August. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Wetzel, did you have anything you'd like to say? Thank you for, you, obviously you did a great job on the board policy implementation, so thank you for that. Well, it was just, a, it was an honor to actually um, be able to be a part of all of this, and um, I had a, a great team supporting me, so thank you very much. Mrs. Whitfield. I just, I didn't want to let this moment go by without uh, making a quick comment about Dr. Garcia, and um, I spent last night going through my Facebook and looking at pictures of him, um, pulling him up and, and seeing you know what he stood for and the impact that he's had on this community with regards to the way that we focus on Hispanic children. And I just, um, I think that this is more than just an honor for Dr. Garcia, it's an honor for each of you who put forward your words, your kindness, um, your efforts to make this happen. Um, I think it's an honor for every Hispanic child in this district, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be a part of this moment. I know that there was no chance this wasn't going to go through. Everyone I talked to kept asking me, you know, what, what's going to happen? And I'm like, I'm going to go with like 99% that this happens, which is not something that I, I would normally guess. But um, I'm just so proud to be a part of this moment, and I'm expecting amazing things from Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School. Thank you all. So the, the board members from District 4 and District 6 can argue all they want about that high school, but Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School belongs to all of us. He was a great friend, and he chewed us out sometimes, but he also <laughs> steered us in the right direction. So I'm very happy that the board, all of us, agree that that's the name of the new school, Dr. Joaquin Garcia High School. <laughs> so we have a board discussion item, Ms. Brill. Thank you, and I'm glad that all of you are still here. I, I have some new business items. Okay. We can, well, you like might to want to. Stay. Oh, yeah, I saw those on there. All I'm of sorry. you might want to stay for the discussion item if you if you have time. CS one. I'm sorry, Mr. Superintendent. Yes. Thank you. Uh, pursuant to Florida Statute 1002.33, charter schools that are below a C grade must present a school improvement plan to their sponsors board which, which is, was, is you all, uh, the board will vote to accept or reject the required school improvement plan that was developed with dis district assistance. The next three agenda items are for the board to approve the school improvement plans for University Prep Academy Charter School, Somerset Academy JFK Charter School, and Sports Leadership Arts and Management or SLAM High School Palm Beach. So I'm gonna take you through three recommenda recommendations and uh, we're gonna have each school do a brief presentation, three minutes, 
and then we'll, we'll take board action. So CS1, I recommend the board approve the school improvement plan for University Prep Academy Charter School and authorize the superintendent and his designee to sign all related correspondence and documents. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Under discussion? Yes, Mr. Tooney. Yes, sir, we're gonna hear a brief presentation from University Prep, Dr. Michael Hill, the principal, Mr. George Grosinger, board member, and Ms. Bonnie May will be here for all three agenda items. Good evening, thank you all for having me. I am Dr. Mike Hill, I am joined by our board chair, uh, George Grosinger. Uh, we are glad to be able to present our school improvement plan to you this evening uh, with, and what we're trying to do at University Preparatory Academy to help our school to grow. Uh, taking a look at our data, uh, you can see we, we took a serious hit during COVID, during the 2021 school year. Uh, but when you compare that data to how we did this past school year, even though we were rated a D, uh, we made some significant gains in terms of turning our school around. Uh, we didn't have the luxury of time and it was a very tough and challenging year. Uh, but just in looking at from the 2021 data compared to 2022, you can see that our school is already starting to turn around and grow. Despite that growth, despite that effort, we have continued to look at ways that we can squeeze out growth and squeeze out success with our school. Uh, we've done some restructuring and we've done some things that I wanna share with you in just a moment. Uh, but as you can see, we are already on our way to getting back to full swing at University Preparatory Academy. Two major areas of focus that we, we chose to take a look at were in transformational leadership. Uh, primary reason for choosing transformational leadership is because we began to recognize that uh, there was a definite need for teacher support at University Prep. Uh, we've been through a, a lot and uh, we thought that the COVID year was gonna be a tough one, but the, the one after that was actually the harder one. And coming through that, we recognize our teachers need support as well as our students and our support teams as well. Uh, so we are, we're looking to uh, add and have already added an additional instructional coach at our school to focus exclusively on uh, the math, science, and reading at University Prep. Uh, primary reason for doing that is just that we recognize that these were areas in our data where we continue to need to make growth and, and development in our school when we compare our data to the district and the state of Florida. Uh, instructional practice was another area that we decided to focus on. Uh, and again, it, it's just looking at the whole picture. We wanted to make sure that we had the growth in, in math, science, uh, social studies, uh, as well as reading uh, for our school. Here's a, the action plan we have, and these are things that we're already putting in place, and this is only a tip of the iceberg. We recognize that uh, our plans at UPA needed to be uh, comprehensive, and it also needed to be efficient and effective so that we can get the most growth in the least amount of time for our students. Uh, so we are, we've not only restructured our leadership team at the school to, to put the dollars and to put the support where it really needed to be in our classrooms and supporting our teachers and our students, uh, but we are also supporting our leaders at our school so that they can continue to provide extensive support to our teachers. So we're, we're adding actual coaching days where we are coaching our coaches so, they, that, they, so that they can continue to grow and support our That's teachers. Right. Yes. Uh, added a math instructional coach. We are uh, added additional professional development sessions for all of our staff uh, and ongoing coaching support throughout the, the school year that we've used to connect with uh, third party companies that are coming in and giving us ongoing support for our teams. Uh, and then finally, we've implemented a program called for, uh, the Four Disciplines of Execution, or 4DX, which is a part of our Leader in Me pro program. Uh, the whole purpose of 4DX is to make sure that we're staying highly focused on the extremely important goals at our school and that we're working through to fruition uh, with our school goals and, and vision. And then 